Michael Katz. Right. 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 Rule number one, if you ever go to a conference, wear a vest, you can go wherever you want. My name is Michael Katch, I'm from the Chester County Intermediate Unit. Uh, this is my 18th year in career in technical education, 14th year as an administrator. And so I've had the opportunity to work at three career and tech centers, one being a multitude of delivery systems, half day about, exploratory, and comprehensive. The Lancaster County Career System, which is senior only, and currently right now at the Chester County, three technical college high schools, and they are half day about. What I found out through my career is, obviously there's not one right way to do anything, so that's why we have the panel for us to share the way that we're going to do it, but some questions that I wanted you to think of. A, what is your application process? How do you know your projected enrollment? Why is this important? If you have an oversubscribed program, under under enrolled program. If it's oversubscribed, equipment, supplies, possibly another instructional assistant, another teacher, an expanded classroom. Perhaps it's a cosmetology program. We all know that they're very popular, and those have very strict rules as far as one student per ten per uh, one per twenty-five instructor to student ratio. Square square footage also has to be given. Uh, taken into consideration. Do you have application deadlines, either at your recruitment tech center or your setting schools or both, and how do those impact your application process? During open houses, community bed, recruitment presentations, off-site, do you conduct any type of application activity at that point, and what does that look like? What is your application criteria? Do you require an essay? Do you have a certain GPA, etc.? Who decides if the student gets accepted? Is it the CTC? Is it the sending school? Or is it, or is it a collaboration between the two? And do you have, offer more than one choice? First, second, and third. Then how do you notify those students? So I guess I'm the lucky person that gets to go first because I grab the microphone first. So in your packet is the maroon packet. If you look to your left, it's a handout. We use an online application system. We did this for several reasons. We found that the paper copies really didn't utilize the data the way that we wanted to, or didn't complement the data that we needed as quickly as possible. Case in point, you give a student the application, they're interested, they lose it. Or the school counselors have them at the setting school, and what if they're not that encouraging of your school? Or that application gets lost, or the student forgets to have a parent cited, and the setting school has a deadline. So we have open enrollment, 24 hours a day, all year round. Students log in. First thing they got to do is create a username that's on page one. And the account is, username is something that they'll remember. And then as they start working their way through the application, it's what year do they want to apply, now or next year? What campus do they want? We have three campuses. So on the on online application page one, you'll see that there's a map of the county of Chester County and the three campuses that complement those. Uh, do they want to enter in the fall or spring? Because some of our sending schools say, hey, we don't let anybody just go in at any time, but some do, but they have a fall and spring, and others have deadlines, and we'll talk about those shortly. We also have an, admit an admissions specialist. How many of us have, have besides a school counselor, sometimes they get to wear many hats. How many of us have, how many of us have an admissions specialist that their sole purpose is to maintain applications and notifications of all that. Okay, so that was something that we had to create, an admission specialist. So if you figure amongst three campuses, we have 2,000 students. That's a very busy person. So how would you do this with paper copies? About four years ago, we had the paper copies. And then it fell a lot on the school council, but we still had an admission specialist to assist, but that person had to drive around the three campuses. Now it's one person from their home base and their computer. What makes it unique is, as the applications are coming in, 
It goes by campus, goes by program, and every Monday, that information gets sent to the sending school, liaison counselor and administration. So I'll know that on Monday, September 5th, I got 75 applications from Unionville High School, 90 from Kennett, uh, Kennett Square High School, et cetera. And they know their applications. <coughs> Why is that helpful? With the paper system, hey, how many do you have? Well, I got, uh, he or she's out today. I think we got 15 our last meeting. Um, they're really not filled out all the way. Uh, some are, do you mean complete applications? You can see the dilemma of a clear answer with a paper copy. This way we control it. We know exactly how many applications at each school. If they're partially filled out, fully filled out. On the application process, a student has to put down their liaison counselor. They click on their school, and it'll list if there's a liaison counselor or all the counselors. Because one of our high schools doesn't have a liaison. It's all their counselors. It also has on the application that they have two letters of reference from teachers. They must uh, obtain from their school counselor who provides us the information. The counselor's job is to tell us the student's academic status, discipline, attendance, and grade level. So pretty simple. And then there's the essay, which I heard some people say they have an essay or they don't have an essay. So these are some questions that I'll ask you when I get done. Any questions so far? Okay, it's also mandatory that every student takes the career scope. We have a career scope specialist at each of our campuses. So if there's 150 applicants from one high school, the career scope works with the liaison counselor administration and does the career scope on site or off site. We'll go to the descending school or during one of our open houses, we'll say the career scope is being offered from five to seven. It seems to be the most popular way parents come, drop their son or daughter off, and then they tour the school. Advantage of an online system. We take advantage of recruitment and application every single place we go. Because so almost everywhere we go has what? Wireless. So we have an open house. We all have them. Showcase your program, student volunteers and student ambassadors, and I'll show you my program. As soon as a parent walks in and a student, first thing we do is we have computers lined up. They must sign in and assign an ambassador or a tour guide. So now we at least have their contact information. You came to take a look at these programs, here's your email address. That's not the application process. Behind that, we have 20 laptops. After they're done touring, we have faculty members stationed at the computer stations. They can apply online that night or during that open house or that community day, et cetera. 10 to 14 applications at every event. That adds up. To some of us, that's a program. 14 students, oh my gosh, the teacher only had eight. That program is good to go for next year. So we encourage all of our faculty and staff to go to these if possible, but if not, have a student representative or a person from our building that knows about their program. Questions or comments on that? So the computer, they can access everywhere. They can access that for sending school. If they don't have one, we have them there. And if not, we will come to them. Because there is very, very small population that doesn't have access to it. We will come to them. If the students show that they have an interest, we'll come to them and help them fill it out. Questions or comments on that? As your, um, so my, my, oh, great. You were saying that every student that comes, every family that comes into the building sits down at a computer first? They walk in, so here's our atrium. You walk in and there's computers. Please, do you need you sign in for the open house? Oh no, here, it only takes two seconds. It's Mr. Michael Catch, email it and or address. Done. So it's contact info. How do you make sure that they do that instead of just starting to go tour through the building? Because as soon as you walk in, we have a table set up, a welcoming table, and there's faculty and staff and student ambassadors waiting. So did you register yet? As they're done registering, are you, you done? Do you have personnel there? Okay. So there's no pay that you're getting by. Okay. Without so do you find that it gets overcrowded at times, or do you just have enough for, for it to all work out? Okay. We have enough. I think there's a minimum of 40 laptops. There's 10 or 15 on this side, 10 or 15 facing this way, this way. So as you're coming through, you're saying, what are they doing there? Oh, well, welcome. And we have people right at the door. Welcome. Have you ever been here before? No. Oh, have you ever registered? Because if they did already, I don't want them you know, to refill it out. Almost like the ID card when you come in your school and you get the ID, the little name printed on there. 
The purpose of the career scope, it's multiple things, right? A, it supports you if it's the right fit for the student, but if it's not the right fit, it looks like the skills and interests for you aren't that. I'm not saying you shouldn't go in there, but it's saying that you're this. Just another way to make that and make your programs available, more specific to the student, because what happens is you might have that parent say, well, you said it was going to work out great. Well, did, no, I showed you that the career scope showed interest here and here, but your son or daughter wants criminal justice. Criminal justice is great. I'm just saying that this is an interest that on this aptitude test, this is where the strengths are. Yes, sir? I'm not familiar with the career scope. Is that a test? Okay. Career scope is basically in, it's like a career aptitude. It's like Yasmin. Yeah, it's and interest yeah. attitude, it'll say, I really like to work with people. I plenty of other ones, but that yeah, one. So it's called yeah. career skill. Do you know what that costs? It, it's typically $25, mm -hmm. a uh, test, and we just do it for free. Your school purchase. Yeah, and, and you know what? Any questions that you do have, just email them to me. My, my card's in there, so I can get you the uh, cost of it, because I know someone's going to say, well, your application, what system do you use? How much did that cost? Um, so. Great questions. Mike, can I jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. So it, it does interest, but it also does math, um, some reading, and vocabulary, more vocabulary than reading. It does working, I think, working knowledge. Yes. Like you get some really good information. It sounds yeah. good. It's, it's an overall, it's not just an interest survey. Do you do that at the Career Center, or is that done at their points? Both. We offer at any opportunity at our school, we'll work with the liaisons, send your students over at this time or at this event from 5 to 8 p.m. If not, we drive the laptops over to the same school if they don't have them, we do it right there. Another great, thing of the, of the, another great opportunity of the online system is incomplete applications. The student will get to know, they can log in, their parents can log in and say, you're still waiting for those two teacher recommendations, that's the only thing holding your application up. If they want to withdraw, they can withdraw on the online system. Versus you're waiting for 11 students to show, Sending schools didn't tell you that the students changed their mind, and the teacher's taking role, and now they're calling home. My well, son or daughter left their school no three months ago. They're not showing up. Why do they keep getting these absentee calls? That never happens, but that's a good example. Yes, it does happen. <laughs> okay, and then after the decision's made, yes, no, put on hold, the student can access that as well. If they're accepted, the automatic letter of acceptance is generated and sent to the students. Now, what makes it unique, and as this process started, probably the most unique thing, is that now you get more applications. Sending schools either support that or they do not. Some of the, some sending schools say, well, we only want to send around 100. That's all we've ever sent. Now you get 190 applications. So what do you do? We had to figure out this problem and did a, a collegial activity. What we do is, as all the applications go in, let's say the one school that I can think of now, 195 applications, we put up on a PowerPoint screen, we have the sending school administrator, learning support, and liaison counselor from the sending school. We have myself as the principal, maybe my vice principal, my school counselor, my learning support person. Every name that comes up there, yes, no, hold. Ah, that student has a 54 in English. I really want them to go, but this is their second shot at English. How about this? We use it as a carrot. If they bring that grade up, we'll put that one on hold. And then you have the ones that, yes, yes, no, hold. Ah, that student missed 42 days. I don't think it's a good fit right now at this point. They've they missed so much academics and stuff that they need at the sending school. We're going to say no to this one. But say that they can reapply. What we found out is we actually got more students by including being part of that process versus maybe the converse of that was the talking to the student out of that. You want to go to college. You want to take that AP course. Oh, well, go ahead and fill the application. Oh, our deadline was last week. <coughs> so it avoids that and it makes everybody have to say why this student was accepted, not accepted, or put on hold. So we're all on that same team. It's a team effort, it's that community effort. Everyone knows from my school that there's a mantra. The, the mantra is it takes a village to raise a child, Well, mine is it takes a, a community to educate one. Parents, sending schools, and business and industry. All those together. So you get the parents, student, education, and the community. So that's business and industry, where is the career and college training? So that's my spiel. And then you can interject afterwards. Thank you.
Don't forget to tip your waiters and waiters. Okay. As Mike's delivering out the maroon folder. Um, Scott Rogers is the Assistant Director at York County School of Technology. Um, I know the admissions process is different at every single school. We put together this panel just to give you an idea of resources that are working at our school. Um, we've all been there. Uh, there's definitely no magic bullet in terms of what is the right way to do the admissions process. Uh, we're still doing an application. I'll explain how we have changed that, though, uh, over the past six to seven years. I guess it was the quote from our first speaker who talked about they're sending us the wrong kids. And uh, I just got back from the Perkins National Policy Seminar where literally our, our U.S. representatives and U.S. senators are looking at Perkins money as economic development. They want to make sure we are getting the right kids at career and tech centers. Um, believe it or not, we spoke with... Uh, lobbyists who are representing a number of large corporations and as much as there's an apprenticeship push now and a lot of federal money for apprenticeships uh, the lobbyists from these big industrial companies such as Toyota um, they'd rather not take advantage of that government funding for apprenticeships because they want to do it their own way because they know as soon as they take government money they need to open up their books and need to take care of and meet the you know meet certain government standards and they would rather see more training going on at the secondary level to make sure that we're graduating students who are both college and career ready that can go out to the workforce so companies such as Toyota could recruit them, send them on to a two-year school as they're going through their training program, and then going on to a four-year school, what have you. It all depends on which technical program uh, they're going into. So just to give you an idea of what we've experienced at your tech, um, to give you an idea in terms of the school and the size and scope, we're a uh, high school of grades 9 through 12, fully comprehensive. Students come to us on 34 buses from 14 area school districts. We run the buses. They come in and arrive at the same time. They leave at the same time. We have our own athletic teams. Uh, 1,700 students. Some of our students will ride on those buses for literally an hour and a half to two hours to get to our school. Um, to, we have uh, CTSOs. And just to give you an idea of the history of the application process that we've gone through, in spring of 2009, we had about 1,300 students, and uh, we only received 375 applications. And granted, they weren't all for the same, uh, you know, masonry, may, we would have been lucky if we got two applications for that program. Uh, we literally had to figure out how to accept all 325 just to meet the quota because the community of York spent $54 million on this building and we were still at 1300 yet the promises were we were going to be at 1700 when we opened up the doors of this new building and the building had been completed in uh, 2008 and it hadn't happened yet. So what did we take a look at? Um, we took a look at the whole recruitment process, uh, school counselors and students we would send out a school counselor, we would send out high school students from, this was the typical process. They would go out to our middle schools, the students would speak, the school counselors would speak, and uh, that was the extent of it. Just to give you an idea, in 2009-10, uh, we had 6,000 referrals in terms of discipline. The numbers, what we were dealing with uh, every single day. Uh, the phones were ringing off the hook, uh, in school suspension was bad, uh, suspension just, that's what we felt like we were dealing with the entire time. Um, we started looking at data in terms of the discipline data and retention data, because every single student that came to us, they had a price tag on their head, believe it or not, $11,500. Um, when we're sharing that data with our sending school districts, and you have students who are literally playing the game of showing up every 10th day just so they can stay enrolled, and you're in your sending school superintendents are like, I'm paying this much money in this student's attendance. And we kept taking a look back at what our policy was to accept these students. Basically, all they had to do was pass the four core subject areas. And we saw a number of students who applied, were failing first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and then miraculously fourth quarter, they passed everything, and they could come on to us. Um, so really, we shared a lot of this data in terms of retention. And in terms of the discipline with our superintendents, as well as our board members from the Joint Operating Committee, 
Um, got a lot, a lot of buy-in and actually revised our policy 201, which is the admissions process. Um, the main question was, is what do you want a York Tech graduate to graduate with and go out and work in York County and represent in those technical fields? Who do you want working on your car? Who do you want working in your house? Who do you want working at your bedside when they're in a hospital, whether it's a licensed you know, LPN or RN, et cetera? Um, so we changed the whole process and we want to make sure everyone was on board. We developed a common message to eighth graders, our director of student services and a school counselor went out. We left the students at home and that was because we could never predict what the students were going to say to the students that they're sending school. We put together a number of videos, uh, one for each technical program and then one for the overall school and you can see those on ytech.edu. Um, we revised the application, which I'll go through in the folder in a bit. Um, to give you an idea, when this presentation occurs, we're able to present to, believe it or not, um, 12 out of 14 districts. We used to be able to do all 14 districts. Uh, I guess we got too good at it. Um, and we definitely saw our numbers increase. Just to give you an idea, we have uh, close to 900 applications in now. It's probably 850, we expect 900 here. Um, we're only gonna be able to accept 425 this year. We've had a waiting list for the past three years. So that gives you an idea of how things have shifted and changed. Um, we also, once our director of student services and school counselor give that presentation, we give out a postcard that the students self-address so we can mail that out to them so they know about our open house. Um, as much as we publicize that, we encourage our schools to do that. This way, they get something back to their house that they can put on the refrigerator. Um, we also set up an interview, which I know people are like, oh, they're screening applicants. We found out that the interview, and we could share with our retention data, the interview is to make sure students know what they were applying for and they really understood what the program was. So students applying to engineering technology, they were not going into automotive because we had a number of students who applied to engineering, thought they were getting in, working on engines, and that was just the perception because we're dealing with eighth grade students. Um, it was the same thing with you know, different areas of information technology, different areas of um, automotive collision and diesel, power sports. Um, believe it or not, kids applied for power sports thinking that was our sports tech and exercise science program, which it wasn't, but it gives you an idea. You're dealing with eighth graders and you're dealing with parents who may not know what those technical programs were. Um, after that, we revised that proce uh, process to make sure attendance counted in terms of the points. It's a 100 point scale in terms of what you can get from your application. So attendance and discipline mattered. Um, the interest inventory, we use career cruising, that's why I was looking on our phone, it costs $795 a year uh, when they do the interest inventory, they do that at our school. Um, the interview, the essay, um, and we make sure we get everything from the first quarter and the second quarter, and then when I go through the application, you're going to see we also get the follow-up stuff third and fourth quarter as well. Um, I'll go through our special education component as well, and when the students come out to visit, once they've applied, the applications are due to us in December. Then we bring them out for placement testing in terms of English and math, because we are comprehensive and um, the interest inventory. They take a tour of the two to three programs that they may have taken, you know, they want to look at to make sure they know what they're doing. Otherwise, they get to make a change on that application. Um, during that time, while our students are bringing them around on tours, our school counselors are meeting with the school counselors from the middle schools to make some notes, talk about the students who are applying, make sure that we've got the full picture um, as best that we can. And uh, from those meetings, you know, that's where, that's where we're at with that. I'll go through the stuff that's in the folder. Um, another thing that's really worked out, we used to have on the application, because uh, we saw retention, we, we want to capitalize on a number of alumni whose own uh, sons and daughters came to our school. We used to have that on the application just more of an information gathering thing because that's what we're seeing. Um, that was asked to be removed because they, they thought we were giving a higher placement if you were an alumni, but it does give us the data um, that's been taken off. We started a summer career camp program last year where these students going into seventh and eighth grade get to experience three different pathways over the course of three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We actually used our Perkins funding to fund that entire camp and pay technical teachers to come in to do that as well as our school counselors. Uh, that's really paid off. 
We give that out in December, so that gives you an idea. We pick those students up at the middle school, so it's like they're going to summer school, except we pick them up at their middle school. They come on over. We had a number of parents drop them off. Uh, to give you an idea, we're surrounded by uh, York County School of Technologies in Dallas Town, area school districts. Um, it's York Township. It's their school district. Then York Suburban is right up the road. They're the top two highest paid school districts in York County. Um, just to give you an idea, in terms of our teachers pay and their teachers pay, they get paid $15,000 more with the step, so that gives you an idea. We had a number of Dallas Town parents and York Suburban parents dropping their students off at York County School of Technology. A little nervous, first time they've been to the tech school. What's this all about? Hey, guess what? They are normal. You can drop them off in the next two days. The kids are coming on the buses and going home on buses. But that gives you an idea. We started to see this college prep trend here uh, with the summer school. Uh, talking to a girl who was in IT going, this school wasn't on my radar. My mom just thought this would be a cool thing to get me out of the house. But guess what? Now you're on my radar. Um, so this was a good chance for them to get the experience of what it was like um, at York Tech in these three pathways. Most of the students actually got to choose a non-traditional pathway, which is another purpose component. So that gives you an idea there, just a resource for you in terms of the career camp application. And everything worked out very well. No discipline issues whatsoever. We had uh, about 110 students that came uh, from the 14 school districts, which was great. You're also going to stay, see what we changed over, oh, in terms of, yes. This is our, the advertising, we did it like a Monopoly game. At lunch, uh, we get to play little games and throw out little prizes and shirts. Um, and that worked out very well. We wanted to make sure every single student who left the career camp walked away with a York Tech sweatshirt or a t-shirt. That way they're advertising our school when they're back at their middle school. And you're going to see that when we get to the application process. This is also our stringer or flyer that gives an overview of every single technical program that we offer. And this was given out to all the students, but also at open house, when you're getting those parents in there, uh, this gives them a chance to see which programs they're looking at, and we want to make sure every single phrase was catchy, but gave an idea of what they're going to do in those programs. The application itself, yes, we're not online. We checked out the online thing. If any of you go to ACTE, um, there's a gentleman who's out there who talks about, you know, finding the right students, keeping the right students, how do you do that? His company actually offers to put an online application. Uh, fortunately for Michael, he's able to have, you know, tap into his intermediate unit to do that. Which is the online application from that gentleman out there is $15,000 that there's going to do. We couldn't afford that at the time. We've looked at going into something in-house or working with the IU over there in Chester County. Um, to do that, but it depends on what you want to want to do. These applications are available at open house as well as the sending schools and the middle schools. Uh, we start doing the open house because we we have students and parents when they come in and check out a technical program. We have students with laptops at every single technical program ready to register the visitors and the parents. So that's how we do. We actually have students who are volunteer that night, and uh, that's how we do it in Survey Monkey. They fill out a fic the quick five question survey. That way we get the information, then we can do the follow up uh, and also track do they apply. So we found out that more of these that we give out at open house, the more applications we got back. Um, so this gives you an idea in terms of the, the two technical programs that they choose. Granted, we have a few pathways, sometimes a few more, S, uh, a few more X's get checked in there. The applicant essay, the entrance requirements, and this is where we're able to put in there now the unexcused absences, the interview, and the interest inventory, um, which has also helped the Safe Schools Act statement to make sure we understand um, what we're dealing with when students come in. And please understand with the school of 1,700 high school students, we are a normal high school. We still get the students who come in and you know never got suspended in middle school or whatever, and then they get suspended from us or expulsions, et cetera. So I just want to let you know it's not all, you know, Fields of green and everything, you know. So it, it just just let me know. The agreement between the parent and guardian, um, there at the bottom, and uh, on the back, this is where the school counselor completes that section, and this is kind of what is the conversation started with the school counselors from the other school. So our school counselors, you know, it's, it's a friendly conversation, and that gives you an idea. In terms of the special education component, Karen Lentz and Linda Rambo in the back, supervisor of special education, and 
our special education instructional coach can speak definitely a lot more about that. But they end up going out to those schools once IEPs have been identified, uh, work with those individuals to go through the task list, to go through what needs are going to be there for those students coming in. One of the things we implemented this year, um, and this is with Brett Fry, who's our department chair for special education, who's also in the back. Uh, this is a list that is actually uh, a worksheet that's completed by the three of them, as well as our director of student services and academy principal. Um, they worked through a snow day on this and a few other uh, days they've got some time together to really take a look at the application, IEPs that are dropped off now in December and in January that follow these applications because we're looking at appropriate placement. We want to make sure that when they're coming in we can meet their needs and we can make sure that we're giving them a positive current technical education experience and so when they do, you know, we re can retain them for all four years and when they graduate they can be successful. And, uh, you know, we don't have all the services and everything that they do with their sending districts, but we try our best with every, the resources that we do have. And that's what's helped. So I know that was quick, because we got Ruth here, but if you have any questions. Well. Yeah. Okay, I will. Okay. Well, I'm going to piggyback on both of these gentlemen, because the application process, of course, for each school is somewhat similar. I think I'm going to go into more detail into that next part into what we do um, in the special ed realm for the application process because that's really where I fit in uh, to this three-person team here. Uh, we do have a, a process typical of all districts where somebody from the guidance department goes to the school, does a presentation, uh, tour of the facility by the student either with the parent or with the school district. Then that's where um, Jamie and I kind of come into play, uh, what we do is uh, above and beyond the typical uh, tour and, and the typical information given by the guidance office. We have, over the years, um, figured that the more time we spend up front in the pre-application portion of the student's ninth or 10th grade year prior to them coming to us, the more successful the students have been special ed students have been once they get to us. So I, it, it really isn't anything unusual to show, but uh, what Jamie and I have done is come up with our, I should say Jamie came up with um, a really nice, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing for you, but we actually have our own slideshow, um, and this is all Jamie's doing, by the way. As you can tell, this is not my, uh, here we go. This is not my forte. But what we do is, uh, so they've already had a presentation from the guidance counselor and, and another student, uh, typically there's several, typically several students. So hopefully we go in either before the school district comes out with the tour, or sometimes it's actually after, and we represent the information because they've got some information with typically no knowledge, Hopefully they've had a tour and they're a little bit familiar with the building. So then we're, we're re-giving them information um, about the school. And I'm not going to go through each slide here. We actually um, talk about uh, the workforce um, occupation, um, the jobs that are going to be available when they graduate. And some of the students, this is the first time they've seen this. And the homeschools don't mind then because we're actually talking about careers as opposed to just steel center. So they really buy into this because um, most of the district teachers don't even know where to find this. So they like it when we kind of present some information for them. Then we ask students to find themselves on there and which, which part of these pies steel center uh, careers fit in so it actually makes a pretty nice discussion and then we go through each of the programs um, but what I, I guess we have really found that the more information we give and the more time we spend with them one on one the better results that we're having so after we go in and do this then we have the students come out, and it's scheduled through Jamie and I. It, it doesn't go through the guidance office. We want to make sure we're talking with them, we're meeting them, we're 
answering the questions. We're asking them questions. They actually make the arrangements through Jamie and I, and um, one of the special ed teachers in every district kind of takes this on for us, and sometimes that's really difficult to get. One person from every school district to agree to help you out with this, but then we have them over, they actually go into the programs, similar to all of you do, but we are in control of that. So that we're making sure they're getting the right information, we're making sure that all the unusual questions are answered, and we've now met them several times. So that when the IEP section comes in, they expect to see um, the younger lady with the beautiful younger lady with the dark hair and the senior member with the dark hair. We're going to get one of the dark haired ladies at my meeting, and, and I've met them both. <laughs> so, which one's going to appear? But those multiple contacts we found have, have that's made a big difference in the relationship that we feel we're getting with the home district special ed people as well as this student and hopefully their parent. And this isn't something that we typically did. It was something that just kind of snowballed after a while and it has had very good results for us because then the homeschool teacher is less likely to forget that we need to be there for an IEP revision meeting prior to them coming. Uh, the student knows who's coming. It's not going to be a surprise who's going to appear that day. And I think the time spent up front, if you can somehow arrange that, will make a big difference in your special ed population as far as them being ready, them feeling comfortable coming into your building, and them being comfortable to know that it's Jamie or I that are there. So when they come into the building in the fall, uh, we're going to be there, and they can identify with an individual right away. So I think that's the only thing that I have to add that we're, um, I know with the size of your schools, of course, and our schools are, are not a comparison. Um, being in the Pittsburgh area, in Alligator, four career and tech centers, in addition to the city career and tech center, um, there are 42 little sending schools. So we have 10 sending schools, but our population is still probably half of theirs. But if you can in any way keep making that individualized contact with that student, um, we found that that whole IEP process up front and then, then what they get into the building has gone much, much smoother. Um, and I think the identification with an individual in the building has been a big help um, from our standpoint. I told you I'd be quick. <laughs> All right, now there's some questions. So I see your hand in roll. So go ahead. I'm wondering how you, uh, in particular at Steel Center, you said you, um, you know, reach out to those students individually that how um, do you identify those students beforehand? If you were a teacher, how are those how are those students identified to you? You know what? We we defer to the special ed teachers at the district. We let them um, make the initial contact with us and the students. Sometimes, uh, for instance, one school district, um, I'll do seven, just like your guidance counselor does. I'll do seven special ed classes a day do a presentation while well, Jamie had to do one this year. But um, uh, we'll do seven classes, and therefore we've seen all their ninth and 10th special ed students. Other districts, they kind of determine, these students are ready, so you're gonna see one or two classes. I, I'm not pushing that envelope. I'm letting them try and make that decision. Every, every school does it themselves. My big point is, now, they're looking for us to come. Now they want us to come, and, and we're making sure now that it's, it really is less effort on our part. They're calling us and asking, when are you coming out? When are we going to set this up? When is the visit going to be set up? Because I, I don't know about your school districts, but I have some, unfortunately, some of these school districts, they have to get school board approval 
to have students come over on a bus to Steel Center that don't normally come over. So there's so many nuances with all the different school districts that thankfully they're willing to take on that responsibility for us. But they are now looking for us only because we've been really nagging at them all these years. But now we're past that point where they actually are, they feel that that part, that additional part, is important. And that took us a while to get there. More questions? Mike, are you a full day? No, we're a half day. A half day program. And I did want to share that we do have a sending school that is a comprehensive, and we work with them to offer them the online application because they do have a program that's in the center of the county. It's a fire, EMS, and law enforcement program. And through this, Hobson is the name of the company that does the uh, tracking for us. And I think Scott was right. Was, I'll be in the ballpark. I guess between 15 and 25,000. And we did it for them for free because we had some space. But if we didn't have the space, it would have been about $8,000. Uh, cost to add them to the uh, online application process. So what I wanted to say is check with your IUs. Um, in Chester County, we did this school, all the 12 schools, we got together and we do everything together, whether it's the paper, the hand washing stuff. So we save cost in every genre of the electrical. We all use the same carrier, et cetera, so to lower the cost. So if you, you go in bulk, and work together, maybe if an online application even for them would work. That's one way to lower the cost. We also do the summer career academies. Prior to the way we used to do it, we get about two, 200 students for the week, at, and the cost was between 150 and 199 Last year we had 900 campers at our three campuses, and we lowered the cost to $55 a week. So by doing that, and bringing a whole multitude of students in from fifth through eighth grade, getting that exposure, and their parents. And what happens is, I love it so much, can I go full time? So they take a program in the morning and a half, and, and a half day, and then in the PM program, they take another program. And now they're so interested that those that attended last year, they get like that secret invite, we're opening up the online application only to people from last year. And it's about halfway full already. Um, so that's just another way, it's a great way to do it. The, Summer Career Academy, and the big buzzword about STEM, right? And every version does STEM different. Everybody's definition of STEM is different. However, one thing I think we can all agree on, that current and technical education has been doing STEM since its inception. So to show the correlation of the academia in the CTC program and related to them, it's like a light bulb going out for them. And you're like, we've been doing this forever, but we're here for you in 339. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to current tech. Yeah, I I do want to ask that you said you have open enrollment. Do you have an issue with that? Because that's our, we're still getting people now saying, we'd like to come to the school for the rest of the year. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, we missed all that foundational stuff, and i got to play catch up now from now to the end of the year. No, uh, we made the decision to have open enrollment all throughout the whole school year, and we informed the student and the setting school that we're there for the student. So if the student cannot do the three years or the two years and be a program completer for the 720 hours, then it's career exposure. And then we offer a multitude of opportunities, whether it's the certifications in the program, to work towards those, or dual enrollment college credits. Do uh, teachers virtual. find it frustrating, though, when they get kids? I think that's the bigger problem. Our teachers find it really frustrating when kids are starting at this time of year, because what, what we find is that when kids are starting now, it's not a transfer student. It's a kid that the home school district doesn't know what to do with, and so we're the last resort. We look at it as an opportunity, and again, it's a culture change. Uh, our teachers know that without students, they don't have a program. Let's face it. So by taking in a student, and that light bulb clicks on, that student could have a brother, sister, cousin, friend, peer, that, oh my gosh, they took you. So we do our best, and our, our theme is customer service, exceed expectations, and say yes. Kind of hard to do, but that's 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 our goal, and most of the time it works out. Um, so no, the teachers, at least to me, don't express their frustration, <laughs> but they understand that it is a team effort. So by taking that one student and working with that student, 
typically what we'll do is also have that student go through one or two, three, like a cluster program. So then they get the beginnings of, let's say they like engine, so auto collision, automotive, and engine technology, and um, power sports or outdoor e e equipment, and get the exposure to find which one they want. If there's time, you know, they're not like a senior, so they can come back in and truly get from the beginning, yes. So what I think I heard you say is a piece to that with the frustration with the teachers having students coming in at any point during the, the school year is you're not putting pressure on the teacher then and saying, okay, this child that has just come into your classroom must be a completer of your program. You are understanding of the fact that, okay, this is where we are. Yes. We're going to give you at least some type of job experience that will, okay, you're not going to complete this program, but you could take what you have and move forward. Mike, can, Absolutely. I, can I breathe some, some blood and guts into this? Um, I'll give you an example. I'm at the, sorry, Pettix Bridge campus at Chester County IU. I push into several different, several different programs, and case in point, there's a criminal justice student that just started last week. Um, she is a junior. She, there's typically sophomores, juniors, and seniors at our school, and the sophomores are totally loving it because the seniors have lots of comfy things to get ready for at this point in time, and they're, you know, the instructors and myself, the instructional assistants are just like, get, get on this girl. Get, just surround her with love, teach her the basics, and there's just a, a there's a team pool for it. And there's a senior at, at auto service. This is his first year. He was kind of freaked out that he wasn't going to be walking. I was like, yeah, you're walking at graduation. You won't have a gold tassel, you will have 720 hours, but you can earn this certificate, that certificate. So again, career exposure, win-win, and just like, hey, new person, you, you know, comes in, you know, teaching the ropes, so let's, let's go. So it's just, it's, there's not frustration. So it's just, it is what it is. Adaptable and flexible, that's what we are. Are teachers still the time for or not key scores for students that if the student's not at the 720, then they're not a program completer. Um, do we encourage you to get to 720? Yes. But there is no pressure on the teacher with the understanding of you having a year and a half or a year with the student. So it truly is the career exposure as much as we can get done. Probably three new things that we do. First year student, every first year of your student, whether they're year one or a sophomore, gets a job shadow. In year two, it's an internship, and year three is co op. So by doing that, 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 that student, worst case scenario, that was there for six months, will get a job shadow, in, or various job shadows in the career choice. Another opportunity is how many of us as teachers are more frustrated with create learning guides, differentiated instruction, and then you have your tap people come into your school and go, I don't see anybody using those learning guides. What about the year one student <laughs> that missed last week? And don't they just go over to that learning guide and pull it out and be self-paced and you come over and you facilitate learning? So we found that as a great opportunity to actually enact the learning guides and then peer-to-peer -peer instruction, level one, level two, level three, and our teachers are so streamlined, I guess, for lack of a better word, are so used to the fact of the level one, level two, level three, that they already have their tasks broken down the same, so it really isn't that hard. I mean, maybe I'm just lucky, but it's, it's a culture. And if you, I mean, if I went to another school or the two other schools I met uh, worked at, they might not be as flexible as taking it halfway through. And for some schools, that's why they only have the application process is a deadline, and you can go spring and fall, or maybe it's just that year. That's your only opportunity. But we find out by saying yes, the benefit is great. You're doing what's best for the student. The sending school is is backing you, so you're working together. Um, I don't like to use the word homeschool because then we're the away school, so we're the sending school. And my saying to them is, for an extension of your school, this is uh, this is the Octor of the outdoor high school, just another building. It's an elective. If you ch chose AP Science, you get your school, but instead you chose horticulture and landscape art, art, architecture, and that's here. You're still an outdoor student. When we do our tours, the whole school, if it's one particular school, is done up in that theme of that school. So Avon Grove High School, you'll see Avon Grove. Welcome Avon Grove students. Every single program, banners and so forth. As next week's another school, change it. And we say it's truly your school and the benefit of the other schools as well. I do have a question. How much weight do you have in your rubric, both of you, on the essay part of your application? 
the the essay point on on ours is a deciding factor if a person has, let's say, they want criminal justice and they say that you know they have anger management. It might be a good tool for them to get skills with people. Might not be a good fit. So they're sending schools as well on that application. They do send the students IEP and 504 if they have it. That's what they feed us that information well as well and collectively where we're able to see it. So we do put weight on it. Um, it it's typically uh, no, it doesn't necessarily have a point value. It's, it's more of finding the right fit of their choices. And or if it's in our Allied Health Cap, our Allied Health Academy, which is a senior only program, or our Teacher Academy, which is competitive, we only take 25 people and there's 80 applications, then the essay means a lot. Okay. Scott? Yeah, I'm thinking it's only 15 points. It is on our policy, which is online, which I was going to take a look at. Just, um, but it just helps. Yeah, gives you an idea. It's just one of the components. The interview definitely has a lot more weight now. The attendance has a lot more weight, and the discipline has a lot more weight, which really helps us out, um, like I said, to make sure we're recruiting and students are We're trying to find the right students for the right programs, and they're coming to the school for the right reasons. And it's helped out tremendously. Um, I forgot to follow up, but we've been less than 2,000 referrals now for the past couple of years. And I mean, it's just part of it. There's a whole extension of everything else we've done, but it's definitely helped out. Talk a little bit, but you talked about job shadowing. How are you handling job shadowing with the new clearance law? Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, since York has that school law right in their application process, I'll have Mr. Rogers answer that first. Uh, for whatever reason, it must be that I'm getting tired. I just want to use that radio voice. Now, right. Scott Rogers. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Now, there you are. That's fine. Uh, Finish strong, kid. What we we actually went with our school solicitor and had them had our school solicitor solicitor draft a letter and literally put together what our school was going to do and we've been following that. Um, I make sure to put the edict. I do not want any kid who's a senior not getting a job because of these background checks or clearances, um, depending on you know where they're working. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible, get the students out. We got our school solicitor behind us. I mean, there's there's the rule of law, the spirit of the law, and talking to our state reps in terms of you know Seth Grove, um, who represents Dover and a number of our students. You know, they pushed it through so fast they forgot about the implications, and they're trying to take a look at that and going back. And that's why, um, as, as a Boy Scout assistant scout master, you know, today this morning I was going through to do my background check and all that stuff for that. Even though I got out of my school, but it's free, but it is not inactive. You don't have to have everything done until July 1st of 2016, so of this year. Anybody, any other questions? I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Do we, are we okay with time? Is it? Okay. Um, uh, you have a number of sending schools. Um, do you have quotas for the amount from each school? Ours is, yes, we do. Ours is done by percentage, um, percentage of the um, consortium debt. So it's actually um, a calculation by district of how many students can come into that's each what, program. That's what we have as well. And as a follow up, I, I see a problem. So mm -hmm. that this is my second year in the position. I'm just really getting into knowing more about this whole in-depth process. But what I'm seeing is nice there could be a, an excellent candidate from the one school mm -hmm. who's then not going to get that spot and a less deadbeat from the school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <what you're> <laughs> yeah. um, it just it doesn't seem right. Doesn't, but there doesn't seem to be. No, any if, if they're if you're trying to make it at least with us because we're smaller. You're trying to make it fair across all the schools. That is sometimes the scenario that occurs. However, typically we're able to finagle that somehow. Uh, with the numbers with, of one with somebody program, from another school another. didn't fulfill, so you're able to snag one from here. That's what I'm hoping point. we can head towards, but it, it seems so set, set in stone that it doesn't waver. Uh, well, ours ends up shaking out most of the time. But not always. 
I, you're probably, I don't know how you say it's, it. It's typically we have a cut score for every single program. Um, so we take all the applications that apply for that program, take a look at it, and say, okay, here's our cut score. And typically anyone above that, they're the ones who are going to be looked at first from those school districts to come in. Anyone who's below that cut score, you know, we're, we're sorry. Unless we get to the, the part of everyone's turning us down, which fortunately we're not at that point anymore. Um, students are coming in. They're excited that they've gotten accepted to the school and into that program. Um, they're supposed to return to their guidance counselor or mail it in. We have people literally running it in, crying, handing it in to the front desk person, saying this is the greatest thing in, you know, in my child's life. So it can happen. Ours is no quota. We have five schools for each each campus, and there is no quota. We have two of our larger schools. They have the AM, and then the three smaller schools come in the PM. Um, if a program is oversubscribed, we do our best to take the student. In the case of cosmetology, we want to hire another instructor, and then we had to hire an instructional assistant in cosmetology. We actually went way out of the box and tried virtual cosmetology where the instructor would teach from one campus while the IA cosmetologist was in the lab at the other. Uh, it was approved by the State Board of Cosmetology. So anything that we can do to accept students, there isn't a limit like one school gets 100 students and 100 seats. Ours is open. And currently right now, uh, we're trying to do something, again, that's really progressive and probably new uh, to even Scott, who I tell a lot of things to, is we're turning the lens around and saying, because we have so many students, in very limited space, my school is only eight years old. It's, it was brand new from the ground up, so eight years old. And it, obviously there's limited growth. We've then built another campus and we're refurbishing our third. So by the time they come back around to either add or, or consider, we're looking at holding CTE programs out at the sending school where we provide the instructor and the program. And one of those is sports medicine. So, and now we're trying to work through that with the start of a school year of 2018. And the question then would be the, the quota. Since this, that school's holding it, do you get 15 students in the morning, 15 in the afternoon, and then each of those schools get, get five? So that's the only one that we're looking at. Thank you.